recorded. This is the Red Ticket Blues Podcast. I am Brian Buckley. This is being recorded on March 23rd to hit the internet on March 24th. You can always listen to the show on iTunes, TuneIn, Radio, Stitcher, YouTube, and follow me on Twitter at BrianBuck13 and at Red Ticket Blues. It's another edition of Thursday Talk. And uh, we have a return guest. He was lucky. He, he was lucky. I was lucky enough to uh, have him join the podcast in October to go over the Kansas City Royals, and that is Sam Mellinger of the Kansas City Star. But this time we get a little more in depth about him and being a journalist in today's day and age with Twitter and every Vine and every and aggregated media. We talk about those aforementioned Royals, get into a little bit about the University of Kansas Jayhawks, and as they march closer to a championship because they are probably the most complete team remaining in the tournament but little other things along the way and uh well let's listen to it he is a sports columnist for the kansas city star and that of course is sam mellinger sam welcome back to the red ticket blues podcast yeah thanks for having me absolutely um on monday twitter turned 10 years old the entire landscape still remains a place to distribute information but it's also turned into an avenue for vines gifs and crying jordan photoshops so I have to ask you, do you miss the world pre-Twitter? <laughs> um, gosh, it's hard to remember the world <laughs> pre-Twitter now. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess in some ways, um, I, I feel like I'm probably like a lot of people, right? Like, um, I feel like I have a love-hate thing with Twitter. Um, it, it is the app on my phone that, that I check more than any other, um, and it's probably not close. And it's great for, like, there's so many things that I see to read um, that, that I would never, ever see otherwise. And and there's just so much, like, stupidity and, um, you know, anger and, like, look at me. And, and, and it's, like, the echo chamber part of it. Like, there's a lot of it that I hate, too. But, uh, you know, certainly I think the good outweighs the bad. And, and uh, you know, in, in this line of work, I don't think you can do it without it. Yeah, I, I always like to tell people it's kind of like an onion. You really have to go through all the different layers of just garbage to maybe see yeah. what you want to see because there are so many agendas, sort of like what you said, the, the negativity, the look at me. It's 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 a it's an it's a machine that you, you have to you find out to find out what you need. Um, you were on the podcast a few months ago and you told us how you have remained a Kansas City, Missouri area guy for most of your life. Uh, was that the goal to stay local when it came to be becoming a sports reporter? Um, not really. Um, I don't think I had, you know, like a set idea about where I wanted to be. Um, you know, it just kind of worked out that way. Um, I planned on going away for school and then, uh, you know, some things, nothing dramatic. I don't want to make it seem like it's really dramatic, but some things happened in my family and it just made a lot more sense for me to stay local. And then, um, out of college, I was ready to, uh, take a job in New York actually. And, uh, not New York city, but in the state. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, last second saying the, the star, uh, the Kansas city star had an opening. Uh, it was a better job than, than what I was, uh, than what I thought I was going to end up doing. Um, and before I accepted that other job, they were nice enough to let me interview it for the job in Kansas City. And, and I worked out in the state. And, uh, you know, like I've, I, I've never, uh, I, I've never expected and I still don't, I still don't think that I'll work at the Star for my whole career. Um, but it's just, it's always made sense. I mean, at, at every, every moment where, uh, you know, I've seriously considered leaving and, uh, you know, the, the most serious of which I guess there's been probably maybe, three or four, maybe something like that, mm -hmm. uh, there's been a more compelling reason to stay. So uh, I'm more than happy to stay. I love Kansas City. Uh, I really do. I, and, and now um, I have a lot of reasons to stay in Kansas City, whether that's working at the Star uh, or somewhere else. But um, I love Kansas City, but I love a lot of places, you know. Um, right. It's just always made sense for me to stay. So, I mean, you, you say you, you've been there, you, you love Kansas City, and you're a sports writer there. Are there any, well, is there anyone locally or even nationally that shaped you to become the sports writer you are today? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, there, there's a ton. There's a ton. Uh, when I was in school, like, so I, I was one of these, you know, kind of weird kids that knew exactly what I wanted to do when I was like 12. God bless you. Um, you know, like, I know it's, it's weird. And, and, 
uh, I don't think my parents ever believed me. Um, and maybe in the back of my mind, I didn't believe that, that it would stay like that. But I mean, seriously, like it, it was like, you know, firefighter, then astronaut, then sports writer. Like there was no mm-hmm. like in between. I never wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer, or, uh, you know, a banker or anything like that. Uh, it was a sports writer. And so, um, maybe like subconsciously I actually think this, that, uh, part of the reason that, uh, I was so focused on it, it sounds really backward, uh, but was to just make sure that this is what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, cause I, I, I didn't want to get the career and then start over when I was like 27, you know, and then you've kind of wasted five years out of college. I want, I wanted to be sure. And so part of the way that I did that was I read absolutely as much as I could. Um, and, it, you know, just I found people that I really liked and I read everything that I could find of theirs. And I reached out to a lot of them. And, uh, and a surprising number of them, um, you know, wrote back and, and helped me. And, you know, some of the people, uh, you know, Mike Vaccaro, uh, who's now in New York, was in Kansas City at one point when I was in college. And, was one of the nicest, most, you know, generous with his time, uh, thoughtful people that, that I ever could have hoped to connect with. And, and I will always be in debt to Mike Vaccaro. But there's been a lot of others, I mean, um, you know, just at, at the star, uh, especially like people my age, it's, it's always Joe Kuznanski, Jason Whitlock. And, and I read, uh, I read them when I was coming up, when I was in high school and, and college, and then uh, worked with both of those guys for a while. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people, I mean, even, you know, now like Greg Doyle, I think does a terrific job, um, in Indianapolis, Bill Plaschke in, in LA. I mean, there's, I, I could go on and on. I really could give you 25 names, uh, if I stop to think about it. You, uh, you mentioned not, not to name drop here, but, uh, you, you mentioned Mike Vaccaro, who was, uh, on the podcast a, a few weeks ago. Guy could not have been nicer. Very, very Oh, good. cool. Yeah. No, Vac is the best. He's, um, he, he, I, I just, I can't. He was one of those people, like, when I just didn't know, again, I was I was trying to make sure that this is what I wanted to do, and, and I wrote him so many emails, and um, and, and they all, I, I was just a snot-nosed, you know, I think college kid at the time, and I, I knew that I was taking up his time, and I was appreciative of it, and, and I remember, uh, I, I must have been annoyingly, like, you know, sorry to bug you again, kind of thing, because I remember he... Uh, he opened up one of the emails, uh, one of the responses to me by saying something like, the only way I will stop responding to you is if you keep apologizing for taking up my time. I'm happy to do this. You know, please, you know, this is, I, I'm enjoying this as much as you are. Uh, you know, fact is absolutely the best. I love mine. Uh, you, you're talking about Mike. You're talking about us. A lot of the other writers you spoke about, and now you, you are a guy from that traditional realm of, of journalism. And today, many popular sports sites are sort of aggregating other people's work. For example, Deadspin, and and calling that work their own. How do you view this style, and how do, how does it how is it looked at in the industry? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I can answer how it's looked at in the industry. Okay. Uh, I, I can I can answer how it's looked at by me, and and I think that, um, you know, it, it depends. <laughs> there's some that do it well, and there's some that are just cheap knockoffs. You know, right. um, you know, there's there's, uh, I, and if I'm not trying to protect anybody, if I could think of the websites, uh, I'd mention them right now. But there's websites where I've like tried to find old stories that I've written, you know, just to, to, you know, reference and, you know, research and stuff like that. And so I'll remember like a phrase that I wrote and, you know, Google it. And it's just the entire thing, That's you awful. know, reprinted on some other website. And um, I actually do wish I could remember the website now because there's one in particular. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I, I think that there's a way to do it uh, responsibly and respectfully. And, um, I think that there's fewer that do it that way that don't, um, you know, because the other way is a lot easier. The other way, um, is to, you know, write a paragraph or two and just say, uh, you know, like John Smith wrote this thing that, and then distill, you know, an entire, column or an entire like takeout story into a couple sentences and be like, this is why he's full of crap, you know, or this is what I think about it. And, um, that does bother me a little bit. I mean, the, the argument on the other side would be that, Hey, we're, uh, 
you know, we're putting your work in front of more people and more people will read it. And I get that and I respect that. And, and as writers, like we all want more people to read, but that's not really what's happening. You know, um, you're, you're, you're kind of, you're posting something that, you know, uh, a tiny, tiny percentage of those people are going to click through and read before they read the rest of your stuff. And there's, there's this other culture of, you know, it's like, I hate how this always sounds, but especially now, um, you know, in, in this Twitter world where people don't want to spend a lot of times, you know, 10 minutes or whatever reading, uh, something thoroughly, they, they want it, they want it quick. And you see some nasty consequences of that. Like, uh, you know, just recently there was that SB Nation story, uh, and maybe this is the best example, because I didn't see too many people, um, you know, plotting that story about the, you know, basically the, the fluff piece on this, you know, serial, uh, you know, sexual assault. This guy, the guy was a cop, you know, right. serial uh, sexual assault. But, like, a lot of people will, they'll just see something that looks like it's well done, and they'll just, you know, pass it on as their own and say, great job. Uh, there's the Dr. V story is probably the best example of that, that, that Grant Lint did, uh, you know, what was it? It's been a while now, two, three, four years ago, something like that. Uh, you know, th- there is a danger in that. And I, it looked like the line is blurry and it zigs and it zags. Um, but, you know, as writers, we all want our work to be exposed to as many people as possible. But it is frustrating when you put a lot of thought and time and work into something and then it's used as kind of a cheap jumping off point for for somebody else's agenda. That is frustrating. Yeah, that totally makes sense because, I mean, I'll go to those sites because I see a nice headline and I'll start reading. And, yeah, of course, there's a link to the original piece. But, I mean, I'll be honest. I think about it. Sometimes I I, I don't even think. I I just go, okay, well, on to the next story. Uh, No, I do that too. So, I mean, and, and real quick, I'm sorry to interrupt you, yeah, but like the, the one website that I heard you mention there was Deadspin, and um, I wouldn't put them in that category of the ones that do it wrong. I actually like, I, I think Deadspin gets a bad rap sometimes. I, I think Deadspin has uh, some really smart people working there that, that write some really, really, really smart things. And, 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 and what they do, a lot of this, they do some aggregation, or, or I, I guess a better way to put it is they'll, they'll um, use a piece as sort of the you know, the, the jumping off point for, for their own point, but they put thought into their own point. And, and I, I feel like sometimes there's websites that don't do that, that they, they do what Deadspin's doing, but without the thought and without the original. No, there, there but, are, sorry, go ahead. there are some columns there in dead piece that are, I mean, they're, they're excellent. Um, yeah. I think a lot of times what Deadspin does is they use a crudely head, uh, crudely titled headline to get people's attention. Sure. Um, Absolutely. there's other sites like, uh, and, and the big lead is another one, which when they write pieces, they're very good. Uh, but they, they also have that same model for the win. There, there's other, there's other sites like that. Um, but yeah, Deadspin does get a bad rap in that sense because there is some quality there, but they have, they have their own issues right now with Gawker and everything. Uh, so see, sure. the, see what the future of Deadspin is in general. Um, Shifting gears here, uh, last year, Wichita State and the University of Kansas met in the second round of the NCAA tournament. It was actually a year ago today, I believe. Uh, oh, wow, yeah. And it, the Shockers won 78-65. to 65. You wrote then that there wasn't really a traditional rivalry in the sense that these teams never play each other, and some of the guys on both teams are very friendly. A year later, and after that tournament team, excuse me, that tournament game, has this lackable rivalry notion changed at all, or is it sort of the same thing? No, yeah, I don't think it's changed much. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, especially as Wichita has, you know, grown into prominence as a basketball program, uh, I, I thought they got screwed on their seed this year. I, I don't know how they were, um, you know, one of the playing a first four game. That's yeah, did you I agree. agree. But, uh, you know, but they, they are sort of a, a, you know, on a level where they recruit kids who at least play with kids that go to Kansas, you know. Uh, I, I don't know how often, other than Perry Ellis, you know, who grew up in Wichita, um, how often, you know, uh, you know, some player has Kansas in Wichita, both in his final three or final five or whatever. Um, but they are friendly. Um, you know, the kids that, that play for Kansas are friendly with the kids that play at Wichita. They play pickup games in the summer season and stuff like that. But, you know, the, the fan rivalry is interesting to me. Uh, it's it's That's where maybe there's a little bit more of a rivalry, but it's more this like, you know, I think KU fans try to pretend like 
which talk doesn't exist a lot of times, um, mm-hmm. or that the, the, that the shockers aren't as good as they really are. And, and I think that Wichita State fans um, get frustrated by that. It's, it's kind of the classic, you know, big brother, little brother thing, but, um, you know, probably exaggerated. Because, like, at least, like, you know, big brother, little brother thing that happens, you know, uh, and, I, and I'm just pulling out schools, but, like, Michigan and Michigan State or, or you know, it does happen at KU and K-State or, uh, you know, Auburn and Alabama, places like that. They're, they're both, you know, major state universities. And in and, and, and Kansas, in that state, it's KU and K-State, which is probably third, uh, you know, as far as like a profile of, mm-hmm. uh, of how big the school is. So it's it's that big brother, little brother thing exaggerated. But the other part of it is it's just hard to have a rivalry when the teams never play. And, and every once in a while, there'll be a state congressman from uh, Wichita who like presents a bill that says, you know, Kansas and Wichita State must play. <laughs> You know, even that congressman, he did it again, I think, before the game last year, before the tournament game last year. And, you know, I, I listened to a couple of the interviews, and he knows it's never going to happen, but it's, you know, one of these political things that plays Absolutely. well with his face, right? <laughs> because people in Wichita are saying, yeah, he's fighting for us, uh, even though it's, you know, never going to happen. But I don't really get the sense, like, if, if uh, I'll, I'll say this, Wichita, if they were to beat uh, Miami, they'd be playing uh, on Thursday. And if they won that game and Kansas won their game on Thursday, they'd be playing for a spot in the Final Four. And, you know, maybe that would change things. It certainly would add, uh, you know, to an already juicy matchup. You know, you you mentioned that loss to Miami, a game of runs all over the place. Uh, And after the game, we said goodbye to Fred Van Vliet and Ronald Baker at uh, Wichita State, who were the centerpiece of the Wichita State national emergence. So with the current one done trends, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Simmons, Ben Simmons is already uh, declared for the draft, and I'm sure Brandon Ingram will be right behind him. Um, will we ever see another four year one two punch like Baker and Van, Vle- Van Vliet? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I like. I guess in general on these questions, I say yes, just because I think like ever is a long time. Right, it's you know? very long. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm like taking your your question too literally but no no um, I, I think that those things can happen i mean i think that uh you know i mean we've just been talking about kansas so it's on my mind but um you know perry ellis is a, a four-year I, that's true i guess i can't remember now if he started i don't think he started as a freshman but he played as a freshman he's been a three-year starter three-year all-conference kid um you know i mean that this year i guess it's 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 the exception right but um uh, you know buddy healed uh you know, came back and, and played as a senior. He's the Big 12 Player of the Year, uh, you know, two years in a row. Uh, probably going to be the National Player of the Year, even though I think um, Denzel Valentine who's, uh, should be the Player of the Year. He's, he's a senior. I mean, there have been some guys like that, but you're, you're talking about two guys that come in together. Although, I guess technically Baker uh, was in a different recruiting class because I think he redshirted, uh, but that's a technicality. But um, I, I think what, what is, if not unique, um, you know, if we're going to stick to the literal definition of that word, uh, the thing that's rare about uh, Van Vliet and Baker is that uh, they both played in the same class and and really are kind of the faces of that push. Like, I mean, I don't know how often we're going to see two guys as freshmen um, play and and be stars on a team that. Um, Josh, they made the Final Four their freshman year, right? They, they, uh, I don't they know if did. it was their freshman year, but they made the Final Four one year. I forget exactly what that was their freshman year. Was it? Yeah, they, I think they did the Final Four, and then the next year went undefeated um, before losing to Kentucky in the right. second round. And then last year, uh, beat KU and, uh, yeah, in, right. in the tournament and made it to the second weekend. And then and then there's this year. So um, that's pretty rare. I don't know how, how often we'll see that, but, you know, forever is a long time. Wow, I didn't even think about that. They did that as freshmen. That that's that's yeah, pretty that's remarkable. A long time ago, right? Uh, yeah, I know. When, I, was, I was saying this uh, earlier um, on another podcast that it was amazing to see guys that have been there so long. When, when you have Van Vliet and Baker and and, and throwing Angel Rodriguez, the transfer from Kansas yeah. State, it's like you, you, with the way things are these days, it's amazing seeing these guys. It feels like they've been there ten years. Um, nationally, Kansas University, Kansas KU has that underlying reputation of falling short in the tournament. Uh, sure. Many Jayhawk teams, obviously big expectations, only to underwhelm in tournament time. Locally, how do fans react when, you know, like, let, let, how, how do they react when they fall short, basically? They freak out. I mean, yeah. it, uh, and in Kansas City is uh, kind of interesting because uh, there's more 
Kansas fans and alumni in Kansas City than, than any other school, but, uh, but it, it's not a majority. And, you know, there's a ton of uh, Mizzou fans and alumni. There's a ton of K-State fans and alumni. And those are KU's two biggest rivals. And so when um, Northern Iowa happens or when Wichita State happens or, uh, you know, going way back, uh, Bradley and uh, Bucknell, when, when these, you know, kind of March failures happen, it's like, you know, half the city is overjoyed. <laughs> You know, uh, like there, there's a, a running joke, a long running joke. Uh, and I don't even know if it's a joke because I think it's serious, but uh, among a lot of Mizzou fans who, uh, you know, like every once in a while you'll see Mizzou fans around town, even now, like wearing Bradley hats or a Bucknell t-shirt or something. Wow. And, you know, like a Northern Iowa stuff. And those are, um, you know, they'll, they'll go to, you know, in 2010 when Kansas was uh, the number one overall seed in the tournament and lost on that ridiculous shot by Ali Furman. So it was, it was like the ultimate, like, what are you doing? Don't shoot that shot. That's a dumb shot. Run out the clock. Oh my God, he made it. The game's over. <laughs> that was incredible. Uh, you know, Northern Iowa sold a lot of t-shirts to the Duke fans that year. So, you know, there's like, I don't know if it's half, I'm just, you know, saying that to make a point, but then it's like half of Kansas city loves when KU loses. And then the other half is Kansas fans, which is, you know, angry and defensive and sad and all the emotions that you would expect. Uh, I imagine it, and it's a good parallel here. So I'm, I'm based in Connecticut here, and it's probably comparable to how the state of Connecticut is uh, when UConn loses. So watching this yeah. cur- current KU team on Saturday night, they, they thoroughly dissected the Huskies. Uh, it wasn't just that they were the better team. It's the fact that I, I, I haven't seen any team like Kansas work as a cohesive unit uh, you know, my wife doesn't watch that much about college basketball either, but she was just, I'm impressed with the way that ball moves around so quickly and they know where to go. Um, in uh, my opinion, they're the best best team in the country. Is there anything about this team that separates them from the past few years? Has it finally just been put all together? Well, I agree with you too. Like, I, I do think that they're um, the best team. And I think we'd probably both agree that that doesn't really mean anything, right? No. Um, you know, they, they could easily lose to Maryland on Thursday uh, or to Miami or Villanova on Saturday if they get past that. But um, I, I think what separates them um, from the last few teams, well, first of all, like last year and the year before, when they lost in the second round, um, there's a little bit of an excuse, um, but it's also true that they were not whole. And, and what I mean by that is last year, uh, Cliff Alexander, who was, you know, their, their main post player and, and he was suspended. And, and now that's a little bit of an excuse because, uh, he hadn't been that good for him. Right. He was disappointing. Yeah. Um, but it is true. He was at least a guy that would, you know, rebound and, and fill space near the basket. And then also Perry Ellis was playing on an injured leg and he was probably playing at, um, I don't know, 75%, 70%. He was terrible in that game against Wichita. Um, the year, but they still, I mean, they, they lost the game and they should have lost that game. The better team won that game. Uh, the year before, um, Joel Embiid was hurt and, uh, obviously has not played a competitive basketball game since, but, um, you know, and, and anytime you have the number three pick in the draft and he doesn't play, right? Like that's a huge, that's a huge hole. But I do think that that's a bit of an excuse, too. Okay, you still should have won that game. They were still like an eight- or nine-point favorite. They still had the number one pick in the draft that year uh, who got like four points on like one of six shooting or something like that. So, um, you know, I, I think if you're going to say, like, what's the biggest difference, it's um, it's actually the, the point that you made. It's the cohesiveness. Um, they, they play for each other, um, which I think is always a mark of the best teams. Um, they don't have a star, and I was like everybody else during a lot of the regular season and thinking that, uh, you know, that that was going to be a hindrance. Um, but I've done a 180 on that since about the last week or so of the regular season on because they've got four guys who can score 20 without playing above their head. And I think that's an incredibly valuable thing because uh, you go through a tournament, and unless you have a generational-type talent, and I don't think that that kind of player exists in this tournament, um, you know, they're going to have bad days, right? So, uh, you know, the way that this team is built right now, um, uh, actually, the, the game against UConn is a perfect example. Frank Mason was bad in that game. And in the middle of the year, when they lost three out of five games, 
they lost those games because Frank Mason was bad, and, and mm-hmm. they couldn't overcome it. They, they relied on him so much. And here, uh, against what I thought was a really good UConn team, a talented team, they're better than, than what they showed the other night, uh, you know, I, I thought that Frank Mason was bad, and they still overcame it in a way that, you know, uh, I know UConn got it down to, what was it, nine? Nine. One point there in the second half. But, you know, KU controlled that game from start to finish. And a lot of that is, is uh, the emergence of uh, Devontae Graham and, you know, some more stability uh, that we see from Wayne Selden. And a lot of it is from Wayne DeBucas kind of still in a spot where, uh, you know, they were really missing this. You know, and he's not a rim protector, really, but he can rebound and he can defend inside. Wayne Selden looked like a star in that game. Uh, I'm yeah. sure some people are probably wondering where that's been the whole time. But, I mean, uh right. He, he, he looked damn good. Um, the beauty of March Madness, obviously, is is the basketball, but it also coincides with the wonderful, joyous spring training. And for the first time in a generation, the Royals are the defending World Series champs. Not a ton of moves uh, this offseason. I mean, there was a subtraction. Say goodbye to Ben Zobrist and Johnny Cueto. For the most part, the team's still the same. Uh, is there any reason to think that this team can't – I realize it's spring training. Is there any reason – that, you know, you don't think this team can get to a third straight World Series. They're, they're the same team. Uh, I think they'll be really good. Um, you know, there's a lot of projections that that don't that aren't that optimistic about them, and uh, I, I think they'll be really good. If you're going to make the case against the Royals, um, it's actually not that difficult to make. Um, y- your case would be that uh, their rotation is weak. Um, it's not just not good. It's, it's weak. Uh, that uh, their bullpen can't hold up, that it's been overused, um, and that they don't have a lot of power. And that guys like uh, Kendrys Morales, uh, who was a monster last year, uh, Mike Mustak has had a really good year. You know, your your argument would be that those guys aren't going to be what they were last year. Um, your argument would be that Lorenzo Cain is not going to finish third in the MVP voting. Um, your argument would be that Ben Zobrist uh, filled a huge hole for them. Uh, it's like a base turn probably their biggest weakness into one of their biggest strengths. Uh, so you, you can make that case. Uh, uh, it's just I, I, I happen to believe that all teams have a lot of flaws and that uh, their rotation can be better. I think your ton of insurance is going to have a huge year. Uh, and I think that um, they're no longer a young team. Um, you know, it's it weird. Like the Royals for a long time have been called a really young team, way past the point where that was still true. Uh, you know, they're, they're not a young team, but they're not yet an old team. They've got a lot of guys who are in that. They're you know, seasoned. The, the, yeah, the, it's like the meaty part of that age curve, right? Like Eric Cosmer, I think, is uh, either 25 or 26. Alex Gordon is, I think, 32. Lorenzo Cain is uh, 29 or 30. Uh, Salvador Perez, I think, is 25. I mean, it's, it's guys like in that age. It's not They're not relying on 22-year-olds, and they're not really relying on 37-year-olds. It's guys that are right at, you know, what should be their, their physical and, and production peak. Uh, so I, I think they'll be really good, but baseball's so unpredictable. Who knows? Yeah, uh, again, it's spring training, but I, I, I don't care what, uh, you know, the the pundits say. I I don't know. I, I think the Royals, uh, they, they, they've they've made uh, stupid predictions look stupid uh, the past few years. So I, I, would, I, would, right. I would be surprised if they went far in the playoffs again. Um, for a long time, the, the Royals' payroll has, has been near the bottom. Uh, but the past few years, it's skyrocketed to the mm-hmm. latest figure I read was $135 million, And uh, along with that has come winning season. So are fans concerned that the team is currently 12th in Major League Baseball payroll? Or is winning the World Series really the most important thing overall? Uh, I mean, the World Series is, is by far the most important thing. But it was really funny when... Uh, the Royals and the payroll, it's been this like, weird thing. Like when the off season started, uh, and, and this was not just like a public thing. Like this was, uh, you know, front office people backing this up and like private conversation, uh, you know, in that, that were had in a context where maybe they were BSing the whole time, but I absolutely believe them. Uh, but they didn't think their payroll could go up much from last year uh, after winning the world series, which was so bizarre. And then, uh, they stretched themselves a little bit to sign Alex Ford. Right. And then like a week later, uh, or whatever it was, they signed, uh, Ian Kennedy 
to a $70 million contract. And, and they're really like, honestly, that there were a lot of Royals fans were like, what are we doing? We're spending too much money. And I just like had this moment of like, if a Royals fan of 2006 could hear a Royals fan of 2016 complaining about their world champion Royals spending too much money, they would murder you and no jury would convict you. You know what I mean? Like this is, Absolutely, like, what are you doing? They, 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 they can afford it. Uh, baseball teams have a ton of money. Um, they can certainly afford this. Uh, let it go. Especially with, you know, because a lot of this, I, I shouldn't say that, like, baseball teams, they all have a ton of money. They all have a lot of money, but th- this is all done, you know, because they, they drew 2.7 million people last year. And, and, you know, two years ago, they were drawing, you know, one point. It was, it was like half of that, yeah. and and the attendance should be up even more next year. I mean, they they might crack three million, which is absolutely incredible. It basically would be a sellout every game, but uh, but they could get there. And 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 the other thing is um, these these contracts, Gordon's and, and Ian Kennedy specifically, are structured in a way where uh, the big money is put off until 2019, um, where the Royals have it might be the worst. TV contract of any major professional sports team, and uh, it's up in 2019, and they expect to at least double and maybe triple uh, what they're making on TV when, when that deal gets renegotiated. So Do a little a lot uh, of this is Diamondback uh, follow that model and uh, rake it yes. serious cash. Yeah, exactly. They'll be signing that green key to a two hundred eighty million dollar or whatever it was contract. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank Sam Mellinger from coming up, for coming on the Red Ticket Blues podcast. But before you go to play us out, I have three quick questions for you, Sam. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Best barbecue in Kansas City? <laughs> um, God, I could be such a shill and just say mine. Uh, but uh, Joe's Kansas City, I think, is the best. There's a there's a ton of others. Uh, Flaps is a place that, that not a lot of people know about. But uh, Joe's for consistency. Uh, is terrific, and it happens to be a half a mile from where I sleep. There we go. I'm writing this down just in case I make it up to Kansas City at some point. You there should. We, go. Uh, the we, we, uh, we we talked about Twitter. You're, you're, you're active on Twitter. Are you pro or anti Crying Jordan Photoshop? I am so anti. I hate Crying Jordan. <laughs> like, I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I despise it. I, I think that, like, Michael Jordan, that there was an article, I, I forgot where I saw it, of, uh, if it was like GQ or Deadspin or somewhere, it, like the headline was something like, before he was an internet meme, Michael Jordan was actually a good basketball player. And like, it was written, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, obviously. Right. But I feel like there's just a generation of kids now that know Michael Jordan only is like the crying face that gets put on every sad thing. I hate it. Michael Jordan is great. He deserves so, better. People, there's going to be a generation of kids saying, "Oh yeah, that's the guy who cried and has the sneakers, right?" Oh, he played basketball yeah, too. I hate that. I hate that. And, and uh, the other night, uh, God, was it Sunday night when Xavier lost that heartbreaker? Yeah. And uh, and they showed Bill Murray in that oh, Xavier yeah. hat, just looking like depressed. And uh, this guy Jesse Newell does a terrific job covering Kansas uh, for the papers. Our beat writer said something like, "You know, please have uh, maybe Bill Murray, like sad Bill Murray, to replace crying Michael Jordan." And if that, it's not going to happen. But God, if it did, I'd be so happy. Michael Jordan deserves better. <laughs> and final question: uh, Will a player ever be voted to the Baseball Hall of Fame unanimously on the first ballot? <laughs> um, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. And some of this is like stubborn, just a baseball do it. writer. Yeah, but like I, I think most of it is. Uh, I don't know what the number is, but there's hundreds, hundreds. I mean, you know, however many is it like 500 voters? I don't know how many voters there are, but it's it's a huge percentage. And um, if you think about it like this, uh, like how many issues could you get just say it's 500 how, how many issues could you get 500 people to all agree on yeah and seriously it's just not that many and you know like griffey um you know derek jeter griffey didn't get it right and and um uh, derek jeter will be up you know obviously in what like three or four years right um uh, jeter would be one um that maybe if you're gonna have a unanimous guy he might be it but i just it's hard to get people to agree man uh, he is a sports columnist for the Kansas City Star. He is Sam Mellinger. You can follow him on Twitter at 
M E L L I N G E R. Just want to spell that out for everyone. Sam, thanks for coming on the Red Ticket Blues podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. There he is, Sam Mellinger, uh, the Kansas City Star. Thank you very much, Sam, for coming on again. He classy, gracious guy. I think everyone can tell that, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Remember, you can always listen to the Red Ticket Blues podcast, every freaking episode ever made on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, YouTube. And hey, tell your friends. Hey, you know, next time your friend's talking about some crappy morning show, you know, Curly and Stu Nod show, and just say, hey, what I... That show's okay, but listen to the Red Ticket Blues. Hey, word of mouth always helps, too. So remember, you can like the show on Facebook. Uh, what else? Yeah, and, and, and remember to subscribe. And if you haven't left a rating, go for it. And follow me on Twitter at BrianBuff13 at Red Ticket Blues. So with all that being said, enjoy your weekend. I'm out of here.